Microwave landing systems are pretty advanced bits of kit, but unfortunately, you're probably never gonna see one. Why is that? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the seventh class in the radio navigation series. Today we're going to be having a look at the microwave landing system. This was a brand new bit of kit that was about to replace all the ILSs of the world. That didn't happen though for various reasons which we're about to explore and nowadays we don't really see any microwave landing systems in use anywhere in the world, not at any major airports or any regional smaller airports either. But unfortunately we still have to learn about them for the ATPL exams so we're going to have a quick look at them today. So the microwave landing system is not used practically anywhere in the world, so why the hell are we even learning about it? Well, I don't really know, but it's still in the ATPL syllabus, so that's why we're going to have a look at it. The main reason it's not used is that GPS and navigating using satellites has become very accurate and reliable. This GPS way of navigating also requires no equipment on the ground to make an approach whereas installing a fancy new microwave landing system would be expensive to upgrade existing ILS systems, for example. So a microwave landing system kind of suffers from the wrong timing. It was just a little bit too late and not worth the upgrade costs from ILS to MLS, and the GPS came in and sort of blew it out of the water. Anyway, it works using microwaves, which are in the super high frequency range, from 3 to 30 gigahertz, more specifically between 5031 and 5090 megahertz, or you know, 5.031 gigahertz to 5.09 gigahertz. It uses two beams, one for the vertical called the elevation and one for the horizontal called the azimuth. Both use the same frequency but are distinguishable through something called multiplexing. This is where multiple signals are sent out at the same time and are given each a little identifier code so that it is obvious where one signal ends and the new one begins. There's also a precision DME used in a microwave landing system which gives the distance to go to the runway, which is the same as a normal DME, but it is much more accurate. So using the vertical and horizontal and the distance to go information, it's possible to create complicated approach procedures that follow curved routes and waypoints in space created by this 3D uh, sort of wedge that is created in the microwave landing system. This 3D approach in space can be followed by an onboard computer and it makes it much better than a standard instrument landing system as it would allow tracks around mountains and down into valleys for example. Unfortunately for the MLS, GPS systems and GPS approaches can do the same thing as well. So it's one of the ma it makes one of its major selling points a bit obsolete. The horizontal guidance is provided by a fan-shaped vertical beam that sweeps back and forth within the coverage limits in an accurately timed sequence. The coverage range is 40 degrees either side of the center line out to 20 nautical miles. As the beam sweeps back and forth, it will hit the aircraft twice as it passes over it and returns to the starting position. For example, an aircraft close to the right-hand side of this range would have the beam pass over it and hit, bounce back and hit, with both hits occurring very close together. If the aircraft is over to the left, then the gap in between the hits is a lot bigger. It sweeps, it hits, it goes all the way, it bounces, it comes back and it hits again. So by measuring these gaps and knowing the precise timing of the sweep, the aircraft's position in azimuth or the horizontal can be detected. The vertical or elevation transmitter works using the same principle. A horizontal fan-shaped beam sweeps up and down within the coverage range. It measures the gaps in between the passes and the precise timing of the sweep will indicate a vertical position. So for example, if you're at the top, the beeps, are gonna, the hits or the pulses, the feedback is going to be nice and close together. As it sweeps, it goes beep, beep. Whereas if you're down here, it's beep, beep. So that's how they get the position in terms of vertical space, exactly the same as they do with the horizontal. The vertical coverage starts from 0 0.9 degrees up to 20 degrees up out to 
20 nautical miles in distance. So along with that horizontal azimuth transmitter, sort of a pizza slice shaped uh, wedge is made, which is slightly tipped up and approaches can be designed within this space using curves and stuff like that if possible. And if there's a precision DME, a precision DME is accurate to within plus or minus 100 feet. Then that's when you can use the curved and multiple waypoints for the approaches. If there's not a precision DME, it's only straight in approaches available and slightly offset approaches which are available. Uh, offset being just offset of the center line, maybe like two or three degrees offset from the runway. And that's something that ILS systems can do. Another blow for the microwave landing system in that case. So the microwave landing system suffers from the same issues that an ILS does in terms of the beams bouncing and reflecting off vehicles or mountains, which means that unreliable information can be given. So what we do is we set up a safe range around the transmitters, just like the ILS. So you get uh, no vehicles or aircraft allowed into a certain area on the runway to help with that disruption and those reflection and bending of signals that can happen. One of the benefits of a microwave landing system though is that the sweeping wave can be switched off as it sweeps, making an interruption. So say there was a prominent mountain in the approach area, the signal could be switched off briefly as it sweeps over the mountain so it does not create a reflection, making a more reliable signal that is less susceptible to bending or reflections. And again, if you've got that precision DME, you could even make it curve round this hill, for example. All in all though, the biggest error of the microwave landing system is its timing and that GPS is cheaper and better than it. Hence this class being quite short and in future we'll look at GPS systems and the study of that's going to be a lot more in depth because they are way more prominent. I've never seen a microwave landing system, never even heard of anybody doing a microwave landing system approach. I don't know what they look like in the plane, I don't know what sort of indications you would get. They're just very rare, but they're still in the syllabus, which is why I've touched on them today, but I'm not gonna to spend too much time on them. We'll move on to the GPS stuff and have a good look at that instead.